This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. The most important thing in this religious tradition of ours, of course, is to build a lasting relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that he has determined and decreed for us. The idea is that every single day, every passing moment during the course of our lives, the ups and downs that we go through are all an opportunity for us to cultivate a deep relationship with our creator, with our sustainer. And one of those most important ways by which we understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is via the method by which he has introduced himself to us. And that is via his names and his attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states within the whole Quran, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا That surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the most beautiful names. So call upon him by those names. We understand and we recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his mercy, by his grace, by his compassion, by his authority by his own omnipotence, by his power, by his justice, and so on and so forth. And like we know that within this tradition of ours, the religion of Islam, as taught to us by the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam, his ultimate objective during those early days in Mecca, the latter days in Medina, was all to create a system and a lifestyle by which we can live whereby our hearts and our souls are God-centric. That our entire lives revolve around this notion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking his pleasure and being content with the fact that this life may be mixed with many a hurdle and many an obstacle, but nonetheless the idea is to strive toward understanding and knowing him via, again, all of these experiences, and ultimately by his names and by his attributes. But many a time, nonetheless, the way that we learn about the religion of Islam, the way that it's taught to us in our cultures and in our community centers and in our mosques and in our Husseiniyas and so on and so forth, is through the lens of the wrath and of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I've mentioned time and time again, unfortunately. Amongst the biggest problems that we have of driving people away from the mosque is because of a failure toward understanding or exposing them to the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that he desired to again expose himself to us. He begins by stating, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, a commandment to us to utter in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy consistently precedes his wrath. And he notes this in an ayah of the whole Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written upon him to be merciful. And such that his mercy sabaqat ghababa, that his mercy shall precede his wrath. And according to hadith, it will state on the highest station of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna rahmati sabaqat that surely my mercy has preceded my wrath. And when you again go toward ayat of the whole Quran, this meaning and this essence of how we should approach our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maintains exactly the same. For in the verse that I just recited and hopefully the focal point of our conversation for this evening, in chapter 2, verse 186, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how we can communicate with him. It is stated that there was once a man who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and he stated, Ya Rasulullah, Arabbuna ba'idun fanunadi O qaribun fanunaji. He states, O Messenger of God, is our Lord far away from him such that I have to call out to him loudly? Or is he close such that I can whisper to him? To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals this ayah of the Quran to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, in which he states, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ 
that when my servant asks you concerning me, then tell him that I am near. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near to us. He is close to us. And as mentioned within another verse of the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسَ That surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation and he is aware of the whisperings of man. That which is within our hearts and our souls, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows those thoughts. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبِّ الْوَدِ and surely we are closer to him, we are closer to our creation than their jugular vein. When you go back to that previous verse, when that man, he comes to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what's so incredible about this ayah of the Quran is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that when my servant asks you about me, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often speak about himself within the Quran? Through this lens of the royal we, this authoritative we. Many times people ask, why is it that God speaks in the plural? Why does he say, we created the heavens and the earth? We did this, we did that. Many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to demonstrate his authority. But other times within the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes certain moments directly to himself in the first person. This is one of these moments and according to the language and according to tafasir of the whole Quran, this is the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about himself in the first person more than any other time. And when is it? It's about when his servant, meaning when you and I, we desire to communicate with him. That when my servant comes and asks you about me, am I far or am I close? Then tell him that I am near, O Muhammad. And I respond to their call. When you communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we talked about it a couple of nights ago, when we make dua, when we communicate with God, he doesn't say my angels will respond on behalf of me. He says I will respond directly to that individual who is seeking for me. So again, the way that many a time we think about God, our perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again, someone who is very angry someone who is filled with wrath, someone who desires to strike down thunderbolts at any moment that one of his servants transgresses. transgresses. Quite the contrary. The way by which we are exposed to the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is through his mercy, through his compassion, and for the sake of our conversation this evening, inshallah, through our proximity. So for tonight, inshallah, I want to reflect upon this particular statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he states, فَإِنِّي قريب, Surely I am near. Surely I am near to the believer. Surely I am near to my creation when they ask about me. And I want to reflect upon the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creation in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding what does it mean when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to us. Second dimension is in terms of understanding what is it that pushes us away in distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thirdly, what are some practical steps that we can take in order to draw ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, closer toward this proximity that we speak to. So let's get into dimension number one right away. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ or نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ that surely I am near, or we are closer to them than their jugular vein. What does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states the word qurb or qareeb? Again, in the Arabic language, the root word of qareeb is qaruba, qaf, ra, and ba. And it's also the same root word of the term in the Arabic language, qurban. What does qurban mean? It means sacrifice, many of us know. Because what is it that is performed in a sacrifice? except that it's done for some sort of a higher power. It's meant to draw us closer to the one that we are sacrificing for. I sacrifice my time, I sacrifice my wealth for my family. Why? Because that's a means by which I seek toward drawing closer toward my family. I sacrifice my time, I sacrifice my wealth for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Or as we say, Imam al Hussein and his family members and his companions, they sacrificed their lives for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The end idea or notion of it within the language is to demonstrate that they're seeking a sense of closeness and proximity toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, via the sacrifice. So when we talk about closeness or nearness or qurb min Allahi ta'ala, what does it mean when we speak toward this notion of proximity to God? There's a couple of different opinions. The first opinion is that this closeness or proximity that we're seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is physical proximity. The idea that through my efforts, through my deeds, I'm slowly able to reach a state whereby I can see, I can feel, I can touch, I can embrace Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like we know within the religion of Islam, that this particular notion is not accepted because we do not believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in any place nor is he any form because he is the creator of place and he is the creator of time. And as he mentions within the whole Quran, there is nothing like him. So when God, for instance, talks about his face within the whole Quran, or when he states that his hand is over their hands, that when God talks about his hand, or when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his throne, or when he talks about his kursi, as mentioned within the whole Quran, these are all symbolic means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking again to his authority. Not necessarily physically, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sits on a throne, nor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a hand, nor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a face. So as for opinion number one, we can say that though many people may hold this particular notion, it's not something founded within Islamic tradition. A second thought or a second opinion presented by some Muslims is that, is that when we state that we are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to us, this notion of proximity is not in this transient dunya, but rather we have the opportunity to see, to feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the world beyond this one. For God states within the whole Quran, that on that day, meaning on that day of judgment, there will be some faces that will be brightened. Who are they? Those who are looking at their Lord. So the belief is, as stated within this ayah of the whole of Quran, or within these two ayat of the whole of Quran, that on the day of judgment, that for the believers, they will have the ability to look upon their Lord. We have the ability to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a common sort of opinion amongst many Muslims, but the response is the same response toward point number one. And that is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces himself or he speaks to his nature, he states, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like him. So when we compare ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and state that God can be limited toward a time or toward a place or toward a form, even in the world beyond this one, according to our understanding of the whole Quran and the traditions, the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad and his family, peace and blessings be upon them. We also state that we can't accept this particular notion or this particular perspective in terms of what it means to have proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that brings us then toward the third opinion. And this is what has been stressed to us in the teachings of the Prophet and his family, alayhim salam. What does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, fa'inni qareeb? Or what does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, wa nahnu aqrabu ilayhi min hablil wareed, that we are closer to them than their jugular vein? That what is meant via these ayat and these ruayat of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, is that the proximity that we speak to is a proximity of heart that can be felt with the body. Not feeling of a physical form, but through the exertion of our bodies, our souls and our hearts, they have the capacity toward ascending, toward feeling within the spiritual dimension, the presence of Allah. Let me give you an example. Most people, they feel most connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe during the holy month of Ramadan. Naturally, we're abstaining from food and drink during the day, 
It is this holy blessed month. We're taught towards supplicating during the night, prayers, recitation of the Quran, so on and so forth. The idea of the month of Ramadan is to allow for these hearts to reach the state of taqwa. As God states within the whole of Quran. Through the weakening of our bodies, we have the potential for our hearts and our souls to ascend. And I don't mean our physical heart again. I mean the spiritual heart. Like we know within the whole of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks to the heart numerous different times. But every single time that God mentions the word heart in the Quran, he's not talking about the physical organ. And he's talking about a spiritual sort of vessel that has the opportunity toward being receptive toward God, toward light, toward knowledge, so on and so forth. Everyone following what I'm saying? So over here, when we go toward these ayat of the whole Quran, what we're talking or what we're speaking to with regards to how we can attain proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we can reach such a level through our effort and through our exertion whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places his love in our hearts. And that's why he states, that surely I am near. It's through our efforts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes these souls and these hearts of ours to be given the capacity to know him, to see him. As that man, he comes to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and he states, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, do you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do you worship a God that you see? To which Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen responds in his famous line. He says, and how can I worship a God that I do not see? Of course I see him, but I don't see him through the sight of my eyes. Rather, I see him through the conviction of the faith in my heart. When Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as if that he sees God in front of him. Because even though he does not see God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees him. As the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salam states to Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, O oh, Abu Dhar, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though you see him. For even though you do not see him, he sees you. And another narration by narrated by one of the companions of Imam al-Sabiq, he states that when I saw Abu Abdullah Ja'far bin Muhammad in prayers and in dua, he would raise his hands like a beggar was begging to someone who was walking by him. Meaning that there's that feeling, there's that understanding, there's that recognition of a sense of presence that's around us. And that's the worship that we're seeking during the course of our lives. And the idea is that that worship doesn't only transcend during the time of prayers, but it allows for us to be elevated to every moment during the course of our life. Which is why when you go toward the maqta literature that talks about the tragedy of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, it is stated that when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was all alone after all of his family members and all of his companions and all of his children had been martyred, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is fighting against the enemy. And one of the members from the army of Umar bin Sa'ad calls out, ilay, la yubali bil mawt. Look at this man. He's not faced by death. Why? Because Imam al Hussein alayhi salam didn't see death. The only thing that he saw in front of him on the day of Ashura was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you take a look at Qasim, we narrate in the maqtal of Qasim ibn al-Hassan alayhi salam that when he goes out and when he fights, he looks down to fix his left slipper. And that's when the army of Umar bin Sa'd surrounded him and led to his martyrdom. Someone says, 13 years old, around the most vicious of all of humanity, ready to shed his blood, and his mind was focused on his slipper, how could it be? How many of us have ever gone for a run or played a sport? Sometimes we're so in the moment, so in the zone, that you forget, or you don't even realize that your shoelace is untied. Someone has to tap you on the back and says, hey man, make sure you tie your shoelaces before you fall. Happens all the time. Because your mind is so focused on the game, your mind is so focused on the moment, Qasim wasn't playing a game, my friends. He was in the middle of battle. And still, he thought about his slipper. Why? Because his mind wasn't on his enemy, my friends. His mind was on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Qasim. He felt the presence of God. He was content with anything that was going to happen to him. 
we have that ability and capacity toward understanding what it means to know and to see and to feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For he tells us, for surely I am near. But you exert yourself toward finding me and seeing me and seeking me. And you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will again open up our hearts to his love. Very quickly, one question that many people might ask at this moment is, if we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what is it that Musa alayhi salam saw? What is it that Musa, Nabi Allah alayhi salam saw when he asked God, oh Allah, can I see you? In chapter 7, verse 143 of the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this conversation between Nabi Allah Musa and Allah azawajah. He states, وَلَمَّا جَاءَ مُوسَى لِمِيقَاتِنَا وَكَلَّمَهُ رَبُّهُ قَالَ رَبِّي أَرَنِي أَنظُرُ إِلَيْكَ He states, oh Allah, the episode is such that Musa alayhi salam, he gets to that particular location where God told him to go to, and he began to converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the midst of this conversation, he states, Oh Allah, Rabbi, Arini, Amru Ilaik, oh my Lord, let me see you. Oh Allah, expose me to your sight. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, Qala Lan Tarani, Walakinindur ila Jebel, Fa'inna Stakarra Makanahu, Fasofa Tarani. Falamma Tajalla Rabbuhu Lil Jibal, Lil Jabari Jaalahu Daka, Wahurra Musa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh Moses, you will never see me, but look toward that mountain. And when Musa alayhi salam looked toward that mountain, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested himself, and this light appeared, and Musa alayhi salam collapsed. A couple of thoughts. If we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is it that Musa saw? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show a part of himself, like some people will state? We say absolutely not. How could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expose a part of him when then we would limit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to parts? And this goes against our understanding of Tawheed. Others will state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was just showing a sign of his and that Musa alayhi salam physically cannot bear to see a sign of Allah. And a third opinion is such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just wanted to demonstrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am going to create a light so that you see that you do not have the capacity to see my creation, yet how can you see the creator? Salallahu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, if I could ask everyone to please move forward. Salallahu ala. There's a lot of space over here. Don't be shy. It's the night of Ashura. Hopefully many others will continue to join us. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in this ayah when he tells Musa alayhi salam, Len tarani, you will never see me. And in the Arabic language, len, this particular negation, means something that continues, meaning it's never going to be accepted. Lam means you no, know, but it means that there might be possibility down the road. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, len tarani, means that you will never see me, not in this world, nor in the next again, because we cannot limit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to time or place. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So dimension number one, again, to summarize, there are many different opinions with regards to what it means when we state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near. The opinion that we accept as taught to us by Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam is that this nearness or this proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a nearness and proximity via our effort such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes our heart to his love. And that brings me then toward dimension number two of my discussion. And that is, what are some hurdles on this path toward finding and seeking proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Every single one of us, we desire this proximity. Every single one of us, we desire this closeness. Every single one of us, we want to be in that company whereby we feel the presence of Allah Azza But what are some things that hinder us from reaching that state? A couple of them. There's probably many more, but for the sake of our discussion, I'll just touch base on a couple of them. The first one of these 
is due to our perhaps laziness or our lack of focus when it comes toward our seeking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. When we want to exert ourselves to attain success in anything during the course of our lives, we know that more likely than not, it's not going to come for free, so to say. It's going to come via a lot of effort. You want to be successful in school, in college, very rarely are you just going to go to class and never study or put in the hours in the library. If you want to get a good job, we know that you can't just make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of a sudden you're going to find a briefcase of a million dollars, you know, fall through your ceiling. If you want anything in life, it requires effort and it requires focus and it requires diligence. And just like we have physical goals that we're seeking toward attaining, similarly, our spiritual goals are identically the same. It requires effort and it requires focus and it requires diligence. And in Dua Abu Hamza al Thamali of Imam Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin, alayhi salam, he notes this particular line which speaks to the nature of us, the human being, many a times when we approach obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He states, Allahumma inni kullama qultu qad tahayyatu. وَتَأَبَّأْتُ وَقُمْتُ لِلسَّلَاةِ بَيْنَ يَدَيْكُ وَنَاجَيْتُكُ أَلْقَيْتَ عَلَيَّ نُعَاسًا إِذَا أَنَا سَلَّيْتُ وَسَلَبْتَنِي مُنَاجَاتِكَ إِذَا أَنَا نَاجَيْتُ He states, Oh Allah, every time when I go and I approach prayers, I tell myself, for instance, that this prayer, I'm going to truly feel that connection with you. And I think that I've got it all solved. I've repented. I've sought forgiveness. I said that today is the day when I'm going to become religious. Today is the day when I'm going to change my life. Today is the day when I make that commitment. All of a sudden, I stand up for prayers. I make wudu. I pray. I put down my prayer mat. I begin to call out takbiratul ahram. And I say, nah, I could wait till tomorrow. And that tomorrow becomes tomorrow. And it becomes tomorrow. Till the hadith of the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states, the biggest door in the fires of hell is known as Baba Taswif, the door of the procrastinators, those who say, I will. It's dangerous. If you recite in Dua Al-Iftita, we say, Oh Allah, you endear yourself to us. How many blessings does God give us? How much does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love his creation? Every time, oh Allah, you express your love for us, we say, oh Allah, I hate you. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. Oh Allah, you take steps to me. You run to me. And I don't accept you when you come to my door. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. He's so kind. He's so caring. He's so generous. As we recite in that famous dua, that dua of Rajab, we say, Ya man arjuhu li kulli khayr, wa amanu sakhatahu in the kulli shar, ya man yu'til kathira bil qaleel. Oh Allah, you give a lot and I give you only a little. You give me life, you give me family, you give me wealth, you give me health, you give me decades of life. You give me opportunity after opportunity, and all I do is I give you five daily prayers, if that. Ya man yu'til kathira bil qaleel. Ya man yu'ti man sa'ala. And then I have the audacity to come to you and say, oh Allah, give me this and give me that and give me this and give me that. And when you don't give me, I get angry with you. Who are we? What type of ungrateful creation is the human being? Ya man yu'ti al-kathira bil-qaleel. Ya man yu'ti man sa'ala. Ya man yu'ti man lam yas'aluhu wa man lam ya'arif. Tahannuna minhu wa rahma. He continues, Imam al-Sadiq in his du'a. And he says, Oh Allah, and you give even to those who don't ask and to those who don't even know you. How many, a creation of God doesn't know God, doesn't care about God, doesn't, does not only not believe in God, but they openly reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still gives to them tahannunam minhu wa rahma out of his compassion, out of his care, out of his love, out of his mercy, even to the one who rejects him. And then what do we say at the end of the dua? Oh, Allah, grant me everything in this world and in the next again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانٌ And I will respond to you. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. And I will respond to you. All I want for you is to call me. How merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The first reason why we see hurdles on the path toward opening this heart, toward that love, and toward that proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because of a lack of care from our own part. A second one is mentioned within the du'as and within the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as is of course sins. Our sins and our transgressions for he states Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam mali, what's wrong with me? Kullama qultu qad saluhat sarirati وَقَرُبَا مِنْ مَجَالِسِ التَّوَّابِينَ مَجْلِسِي أَرَبَتْ لِي بَلِيَّةٌ أَزَالَتْ قَدَمِي وَهَالَتْ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ خَدْمَتِكَ يَا سَيِّدِي He states, oh Allah, he says, and at that moment I say that's it with all of my sins and all of my transgressions. Today again is that day. So I go and I raise my hands and I seek forgiveness and I repent and I say, oh Allah, I'm sorry. And I say from today is going to be that day. All of a sudden, a few moments later pass. And again, those thoughts enter into my mind. That sin enters into my mind and I begin to engage in it and I can't keep myself away from it. Oh Allah, what's wrong with me? When we consistently transgress the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's difficult for us to again to be exposed toward that mercy and toward that light and toward his love. Which is why we need to enter into that state of forgiveness from our creator with this utter and absolute sincere heart, emptying it of all vice and of all transgression. And that brings me then to third my third dimension. How can we make sure that we fill these hearts with that sense of love and that sense of conviction and that sense of faith such, such that it draws us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he can state in qareeb that surely I am near to you, O my servant. Again, there are many. I'm going to focus upon three today. The first one of these and perhaps most important of them is to make sure that we're resetting our intentions in terms of our understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Again, like we said before, in the very beginning of this talk, that for many people, they understand or they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of a fear that they have out of him. As we get older, we understand that in life, we need incentive sometimes as an extra drive. So perhaps as we get older, we say, I want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I have this really, really important job interview tomorrow. So I better start to make sure that I'm fulfilling all of my prayers today. Or because we have a haja from God that we want to be responded to. So we begin to fast during the holy month of Ramadan. That throughout the course of our lives, from when we're young, many a times we learn via discipline. As we get older, we learn through incentive. But at the end of the day, these forms and these manifestations of worship of God are not sustainable over a long period of time. For in the famous line of Imam Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib ibn alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salam alayhi He states, Ilahi ma abadtuka khawfan min narik. Wa ma abadtuka tama'an fi jannatik. وَلَكِنْ أَبَدْتُكَ لِأَنَّكَ أَحْلٌ لِذَلِكَ Oh Allah, I did not worship you for fear of your punishment. Nor do I worship you for hope in your paradise, but rather I worship you because you are worthy of worship. You, we worship you, oh Allah, because you have those most beautiful names. I worship you, oh Allah, 
Not because I'm concerned about punishment. Not because I have this hope in paradise. That's fine if that's the way that we know God. That's the way that we're introduced to God. That's the way that we might understand God for some points in our life. But the idea is to elevate beyond that. If every single day, or if you went to your boss, you went to your manager at your place of work, and you told them, by the way, the only reason why I'm here is to collect my paycheck at the end of the day. They're going to say that you're not going to be working here for very long after because you're not committed to the task. You're not committed to the mission statement. You're not committed to the cause. If you don't care about your work, somebody's going to catch on. But then imagine you go and you admit it. How arrogant is that? Imagine every single day I admit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, the only reason why I'm here is because I need you to provide for me. The only reason why I'm here, oh Allah, is because I don't want you to punish me. It's not a relationship that's sustainable. It's not a relationship that's based on those ways that God introduces himself. Rahmatihi. By his mercy, by his compassion, by his love, by his care. Again, number one, step number one, in terms of allowing for ourselves to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to understand that we need to be in a state of worship and obedience to God because he is worthy of worship. Because we want to demonstrate our thankfulness to him. Because why would I not want to worship this Lord who cared for me, who sustained for me, who loved me, and so on. Number one, a second step that we need to take in order to draw ourselves toward proximity toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going back towards some of those flaws that we may have is to make sure again that we're remaining dedicated and that we're remaining focused and that we're remaining diligent. I don't have too much time to discuss this, but very, very briefly, the performance of deeds like consistent recitation of the Qur'an or recitation, for instance, of Salatul Layl, the night prayer, or all means by which we can demonstrate our focus and our exertion toward our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thirdly and finally, running out of time, the third step that we can take in order to draw ourselves to proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of course to draw nearness to those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and who he has commanded us to love. An Fudayl ibn Yasar, an Abi Ja'far alayhi salam, Fudayl ibn Yasar, he narrates from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, Buni al-Islam ala al-Khams, that this religion is built on five things. Ala salati wa zakati wa sawm wa al-hajji wa al-wilayah. On prayers and on fasting and on charity and on hajj and on wilayah and on the authority of these Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And none of these is called upon with more focus as loudly as wilayah. For the majority of people have hold steadfast to the first four, but they've left the last one, meaning wilaya. They've left the authority of those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to love, which is why 50 years pass after the passing of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, and our master Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam is left alone on the plains of Karbala alone, hungry, and thirsty. On the night of Ashura, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, as he tells his companions and his family members, inviting them to go back home, telling them, you don't need to support me on this particular eve. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he turns off those candles. He turns them back on after only a couple of moments, only to see every single one of those faces staring directly at Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, saying, Oh Aba Abdullah, as the head of Milqain utters, that, Oh my master Hussein, that if they were to take my body and they were to kill me and they were to chop it up into a thousand pieces and then God were to resurrect me a thousand times for you, Oh Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he goes to the children of Aqil. He says, You've already sacrificed Muslim. Why don't you go back home to Kufa? They said, How can we leave you, O Abba Abdullah? 
One by one, the companions of Imam al Hussein they demonstrate their loyalty and their courage to their master, Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. And on the 10th of Muharram, they exerted themselves and they fought valiantly and courageously to the extent that today we call upon them, Assalamu alaikum ya ansar Abi Abdullah. But on this night, the night of Ashura, as we traditionally do, we mourn those last moments in the life of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. After everyone from his family members and companions had left him, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was all alone. So I want you to take your minds and I want you to take your hearts toward those last moments in the life of Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam on this eve. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he goes into the tent of the children of Aqil and he sees that no one is there. He goes into the tent of the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib, his brothers, and he finds no one there. He goes into the tent of Imam al Hassan's children and he sees that none of his nephews are there. He goes into the tent of the children of Abdullah ibn Ja'far and he sees again that his nephews are there. None of his nephews are there. Then he goes to the tent of his companions to see if anyone from amongst them is remaining and he realizes that none of them are there. So he exits into the middle of the battlefield and he makes his epic call. He calls out Halman Nasr. Is there anyone to help me on this day? Is there anyone to protect the sanctity of the women of the Messenger of God? At this moment, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he realizes he's the only one left on Karbala's plains. So it is said that he looks up to the skies and he says, Oh Allah, bear witness that I made this call and that no one has responded to me. We say to Abu Abdullah. That our Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, though we could not be there on that day, we respond to your call with our tears and with our screams. At this moment, it is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he exits from the middle of the battlefield going to the tent. He goes to his sister Zainab and he tells her, Now, Walini, Waladi, Arradi, oh my sister Zainab, give me my infant son. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he gathers his child. He wraps him in a small shroud in order to cover him from the son of Karbara. It is said that he turns around in order to embrace him, in order to kiss him. Perhaps the narration states that at this moment, some of the women, they say, Oh, Abba Abdullah, this child is weeping. This child is crying for the entirety of the day. But over these last few moments, he's even stopped to cry. Perhaps he doesn't have any water, he doesn't have any milk in his body. We're afraid for his life. So the report states that at this moment, Lady Zainab says, Oh, Abba Abdullah. Why don't you take your child to the plains of Karbara? Why don't you ask the army of Umar bin Sa'id to see if one of them has the courage, one of them has the compassion to give this child some water? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he begins to make those strides to the middle of the plains of Karbara. He raises this child, he calls out to Umar bin Sa'id, Oh Umar bin Sa'id, if your issue is with me, then you have me. If your issue is with my family, then you've killed them. But what sin has this six month old? infant performed such that you do not share with him one sip of water at this moment what am i going to say my friends what am i going to say oh Shia? how am i going to utter these words at this moment it is said that Umar ibn Zad, he looks toward Hormana ibn Kahan and says oh Hormana he says go and strike him at this moment Umar ibn Zad, he's asked by Hormana he says oh Umar ibn Zad, should i strike the father or should i strike the son at this moment he he says, strike the child. So he takes that arrow and he strikes it toward the neck of the six month old infant Abdullah Radhi. All of a sudden, it is said that Imam al Hussein goes to embrace that child only to see that his neck has been severed. Only to see that the neck of the six month old infant has been severed. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam has blood on his hands. He doesn't know what to do. So again, he looks up at the sky and he says, Hawad Aman is an Abi and the Hubayn Allah. Oh, Allah, it suffices to me that this was performed under your eyes. It is said that at this moment, Imam al Hussein doesn't know what to do. So he walks back toward the plains of Karbala. Between that and the tent of Rabab, doesn't know how to tell his doesn't know how to tell the child's mother what happened. So it is said that Imam al Hussein, according to this report, he begins to call out, "Inna Allah, wa inna ilayhi raji'un, wa taslim al-amr." At this moment. Imam 
Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, he takes the body of his six month old infant and he begins to take it behind the tents of Zainab. He takes out his sword and he begins to dig a small grave for that child. And he places this grave into the child. He places this grave into, he places this body into the ground. I ask you this, my dear friends, for every one of the other companions and family members, Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam didn't bury them on the day of Ashura. He just picked up their body and left them to the side. But why did he do that to his child? Because he was afraid that they were going to sever his head in the same way that they did with all of the other. I'll leave you with this last one on this night of Ashura. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is now all alone. I just imagined after a few moments from that moment, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is riding on top of that horse. And once again, Hurmala ibn Kahal, he is ordered to strike an arrow toward the chest of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. We'll narrate that tomorrow. But in this particular moment, he struck a one arrow that severed the neck of Ali al Asghar. But on the 10th, of Muharram on the day of Ashura when Imam al Hussein was all alone. The report states that Hurmala ibn Kahil took a three pronged arrow that was used toward killing camels in the middle of the desert. He struck that through the chest of your master, Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And Imam al Hussein falls down from the horse only a few moments, my friends, until Shamar ibn Dujoshin would sit on his chest and begin to serve his. <laughs> Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. If you like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.